this is Think Tech Global Connections. I'm Jay Fidel, and we're talking about Ukraine. We're asking the question, why does Ukraine matter? Seems obvious, but let's look at the reasons with a fellow who's just uh, published a book on the subject. It's called Why Ukraine Matters. It's Fazl Chowdhury. We've talked to him before about Afghanistan and Iran, about books he's written. He's been, what shall I say, prolific. Hi, Fazl. Nice to see you. Thank you, Jay. Pleasure to be here. So I, I don't think I have to ask why you wrote the book. There's really nothing more important in our world today uh, than you know the liberal world order and, and its survival in Ukraine. But let me ask you the question anyway. Why did you write this book? Well, this book was uh, initially, the foundations of it was started 20 years ago. Uh, when I was a student at university, I picked a thesis of a lot of the factors that we are talking about today. And so if you look at some of the chapters in the book, uh, they have a lot of significance connections and parallels to historical uh, happenings uh, to what we are seeing at present. Uh, for instance, uh, this is not the first time Ukraine has battled uh, Russia. There was a, a war in 1917 in the Bolshevik Re Revolution and followed by the Ukraine Independence War. And a lot of it, a lot of the a lot of the struggles that we see on the Ukraine side, as well as how it has penetrated the international affairs discussions, is similar, though not exactly the same as what we dealt nearly more than a century ago. It strikes me that um, most of the aggression that we've seen in the past, what, 20 years or so has been Putin. <laughs> He's got a yeah. thing about Ukraine, and he keeps on doing it over and over again. This is like yeah, the, the third or fourth war he's had with them. Well, I mean, this is uh, four Soviet leaders, uh, and I'm going to rewind this a little bit. So every single leader or ruler of Russia has had something or another to do with Ukraine. Uh, the, 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 the last Tsar, Tsar Nicholas II had a, a very deep connection with the religious class in Kiev. Uh, Lenin, uh, initially when he came to power, kind of felt to keep a hands off, on, hands off from Ukraine. But later on, he realized to build the industrialization process for Russia to gain ground and to basically match that of the empires of Europe and even the, of Western Europe. He needed Ukraine, not just its grains to industrialize, but also to steal many of the things that the country had. Um, and that is a very similar playbook that has been played from that time onwards. Uh, Joseph Stalin has used it in the form of his policy of Holdemore, which many of us know as the starvation of Ukraine. Um, his successor, uh, uh, his, uh, his successor also uh, primarily focused on not so much the assault on Ukraine, but more so towards expanding the borders of Ukraine and vis-a-vis -vis that would expand the border of, of, of the Soviet Union. And, and this is what I mean by the fact that, and even his successor, uh, 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 Brezhnev, Brezhnev went so far as to say that, okay, I'm going to do something, but at the same time, there are other things that I'm going to go buy Ukraine. His, his interference in what was then uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, his interference in particularly in Afghanistan, these are all lessons that the Soviet playbook kind of harmonizes in all rulers. And when you see what Gorbachev tried to do, and Gorbachev, for all intents and purposes, one of the reasons why uh, he kept a very hands-off to Ukraine is because he had Ukrainian lineage. So did Brezhnev. Um, but this was not completely hands-off. It was basically to understand, okay, if it works in Ukraine, it can work somewhere else. And this is what I try to emphasize in this book, is that every czar, every Soviet leader, every now Putin in the last 20 years, though initially he had a hands-off process between uh, between. 2000 and 2002, but 2004 onwards, this process 
particularly with President Putin, becomes much more the volume gets pumped up. You see the Orange Re Revolution in 2004. You see uh, a significant, significant kind of political activity and political interference from Moscow into Kiev's affairs. Um, you see that particularly in uh, the in the uh, how do I put it the Orange Revolution's uh, non-success. It it begins in the form of a revolution that can work to democratize the societies, bring Ukraine closer to the European Union. But this all becomes kind of like a like a drama that basically on one end it's getting pulled by Russia, on another end Europe is saying that, okay, let's bring it into the 21st century standard. And so in this book, I also mentioned the fact that Putin particularly from 2000 to 2008 is kind of hands off, but he's just testing the pulses of Ukraine. But 2012 onwards, this becomes not just a pulse check, but really kind of like do as I say, and really take the initial steps to build the foundations to pull Ukraine into the into the Russian sphere. And one of the reasons which I highlight, particularly in this book, in 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 a few chapters, is to say that Ukraine's industrial past did leave a strong foundation for what it could have possibly and potentially would have had a, a, a hydrocarbon gas economy. And that gas economy, if materializes, will bring significant help to Europe. And I think many of uh, President Putin and his inner circle saw this as a direct threat, and particularly in the Donbass area. So in- so What's, what's a gas economy, Basil? So, uh, so, you're, so in Ukraine, you have two big, two big large consumption economies. One is the oil, which you understand is the petroleum economy. The other is the gas. Now the gas part is it works through terminals, but it is also a competitor to Russia. Presently, Russia is the one that basically provides Europe with heat. It provides about forty percent of Europe's heat. Now remove Russia out of that equation and bring Ukraine. Ukraine potentially can provide sixty percent of Europe's heat, but it has to go through a period of a lot of infrastructure building, a lot of site installations, a lot of development in the form for that could happen. And this has been in conversation within the European Union since 2014. And this is where I particularly mentioned the fact that in 2014, one of the reasons why you have a slicing of the Crimea, the Russian annexation of Crimea, is to lay the groundwork to pull that outcome to not happen. Hmm. You know, I just uh, unpack some of the things you mentioned. And by the way, the, the, you know, this book is, is really filled with analysis that uh, we haven't heard before. Uh, analysis the press hasn't really covered. Uh, connecting the dots, to use the phrase we often use over here. And um, uh, we appreciate that. We appreciate the, the fact that you're taking the various uh, elements of the history of Ukraine and putting it together for us. And thank you for that. Um, you know, the, but the, um, what I get from the book and your discussion just now is that Ukraine is, is very important, was very important um, to the Soviet Union. Uh, it was um, um, a kind of a, 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 a dagger uh, into Russia from, from the West. Um, it was offensive in the sense that it was threatening, but also that it represented Western values, Western you know, industrial possibilities, as you say, um, Western culture for that matter. Ukrainians are, you know, largely Slavic people, but they're also Western European people. Uh, and this is all very threatening to somebody like Putin, who is essentially a, a Slavic person. Um, so, you know, what we have here is something that um, was a great asset to the USSR, a great possibility. And when it came apart, when the USSR came apart, perhaps you could say that Ukraine was its greatest loss. Not, you know, uh, the stands, uh, Uzbekistan and the like, but Ukraine, because Ukraine had greater possibilities, uh, greater history, um, you know, economic leverage than any of them. Am I right? Well, it's, I mean, you are right in a, a lot of the factors, but one of the things that I like to highlight is that Ukraine. Ukraine had 
the most DNA link to the Russian Empire or the Soviet state than any other 15 republics. And I say that because it housed the largest stockpile of nuclear weapons that belonged to Russia. And th there's, there's a lot of that that I mentioned this in, in the chapters of this book is to say that, you know, not only did it house a large stockpile of nuclear weapons for Russia, but all the industrialization, all the military equipment, all the military depots, all the military hardware had been housed in Ukraine. And it was very much this central area because, let's keep in mind, majority of Soviet, uh, 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 how, how should I say, interactions or even conflict interactions into Europe was via Ukraine. Uh, when you see the 70 years of communism between interference, Soviet interference, particularly that begins from the time of liberating Berlin, majority of these uh, uh, attacks came and were basically set up from the Ukrainian areas, okay? And this is no different from Ukraine's history. Like, you know, President Putin says, Ukraine is a part of Russia for, the, for a thousand years. Absolutely untrue in a lot of senses. Ukraine had its identity in itself for more than 1700 years. It was part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. It was sliced into three empires between the Habsburgs, the Russians, and the Prussians. And the Catherine the Great, who was part of the Russian Empire, Prussian-born, inherited these lands, inherited Kiev and Rus, but the, the practice of going and attacking and basically keeping Europe in bay, at bay had never changed. And Ukraine provided that center kind of uh, space for those things, for those activities, for those Soviet activities to happen. And so when you take that out of that equation, you're basically removing Russian link to Europe. If Ukraine goes to the European Union and, like you say, you know, kind of develops its European heritage, connects itself more into the European Union, connects itself more to the European way of economics, this is a huge threat for not just the foundation of, his, foundation of history for Russians, but also the elite in Moscow who believes that no, if businesses are to work and to work well, we will provide the foundation. But the foundation layers shall rest with us, not through an integration of collective economic system. Very interesting. You know, and um, you know, the, I'd like to uh, drill down a little with you about the presence of the nuclear weapons in Ukraine. Mind you, Ukraine, you know, for the USSR was a, a border. It was a border state between Russia, U USSR, and Europe. So it's only natural that there be um, weapons there to ostensibly protect Russia from Europe. Uh, and no surprise that Ukraine had the largest share of those weapons. It was on that border. Can you talk about how that all ended? Yeah, so uh, there, was a, there was a conference uh, called the Bud Budapest Referendum of Security and Assurances that, was, that basically brought all the world powers, including Russia, to sign to say that we will honor Ukraine's sovereignty in return when uh, Ukraine basically gives up its right to carry any nuclear weapons of sorts. And, um, and that happened. That happened under the administration of President Clinton. It happened under the administration of President Yeltsin. And this is something that has been a sticking point to many European scholars is the fact that while Russia has been a signatory for guaranteeing Ukraine's sovereignty, now it has violated it. And it has violated it, but some of the problems with this assurance goes back to say that, okay, if, if we have committed to the security, but then what are the consequences if somebody decommits? And that has never been mentioned. That has been, never been talked about. And one of the reasons why I believe that has never been talked about was because it was a good faith agreement. It was a good faith agreement to say that if Ukraine was to give up its nuclear weapons and its stockpile of weapons, it would be easier for that country not to become a North Korea of Europe. And well, you, you what, said if somebody decommits, what do you mean? Who's somebody and what's decommission mean? Well, what I mean by that is like, suppose uh, 
you know, Russia signs the agreement and say, we honor, uh, the, uh, we honor Ukraine's sovereignty, and now it goes and invades its lands. I mean, yeah, that seems like a gross violation of that particular agreement. How, yeah. how does Putin and Russia, how do they justify that? That must be a real interesting, you know, a real interesting mental gymnastics. Well, it's interesting. One of the things I was doing in, in basically writing this book was I was talking to a lot of reporters on the ground through Twitter, through numerous uh, emails and through my networks. And one of the reporters was very kind enough to explain to me this detail and this kind of uh, phenomenon where to say that, uh, that it wasn't Putin's administration that signed the referendum, it was Yeltsin's, uh, Yeltsin's administration. So thereby, they are not obligated to be part of this. Uh, internationally, yes, but regime-wise, no. That's interesting, an interesting way to break an agreement. Mm -hmm. um, it was my predecessor, not me. Right. So every time there's a successor in power, you can break every agreement. This does not lead to international respect, I would say. No, but this is something that's very common and one that has worked very well to the Russian, Russian way of basically manipulating communication and language. Because much of the propaganda around President Putin's uh, engineering of this is that while well, the West has violated its own agreements because they honor to say that after the Soviet Union fell, we will not move east. And they have. Um, and so how do you make sense of that? And I looked into this and I had a number of kind of episodes of understanding this dilemma between how does this kind of logic work? And what has happened is uh, the kind of propaganda that President Putin's engineering has worked is because to mimic the West uh, in a way to say that, you know, the West said it would not move east, but it is did. That, is that part of the agreement, Fazl? Uh, that was not part of the agreement that Russia signed in the Budapest referendum. Um, this, was an, this was an agreement that was done between uh, Gorbachev and, and the German chancellor at the time uh, to say that, okay, if we unify east, what was then East Germany and West Germany, uh, how do we know NATO does not move eastwards? And so the agreement at the time was, in return for the unification of Germany, that Germany would assist in financial controls in any kind of deficits that the Soviet Union would have leading up to it. Of course, we all know that after 1991, the Soviet Union disbanded. So again, you run into this other kind of conundrum where to say that, okay, we would help you with the financial controls, but then now the Soviet Union doesn't exist. And Russia is its inheritor, but Russia is not Soviet Union. And here you have another set of propaganda. And, and Putin was there. Putin was there. And, no, no. And, Putin was not there initially. This was still uh, the first no, phase. No, no, not, not as the leader of Russia, but he was there as part of the KGB. The famous right. story in, uh, in yeah. East Berlin, uh, yeah. how, how he protected the Russian embassy in East Berlin. Yeah, uh, I mean, there were riots, and the, but there were riots against the regime in East Germany. And so here's another story that has been kind of like funneled, like, you know, when you look into these reports, and I certainly did into these archives, is that much of these, much of these angers within the local population had to do with their smaller regimes, like the, the leadership in East Germany and the leadership of East German areas. They were not necessarily targeted towards Russians, although that was the case in some areas. But this propaganda machine has basically turned that around to show that the West has taken advantage when Russia was weak. The West has taken advantage when Soviet Union was weak. And that, in one sense, is, is in some part true, but in other senses, you know, this is an area, particularly in context to Germany, that unification meant that certain leadership had to be removed. Revolutions had to happen. Protests needed to happen. But if those things happened, you know, whether or not uh, you had East German installations or Russian installations in place, they were going to be attacked anyway. 
whether Putin was going to be there or not. Yeah. Well, you know what? One thing that comes out of this is uh, you're, you're saying that uh, uh, it was not part of the agreement uh, where uh, Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons, um, but uh, Putin apparently treats it as part of the agreement. And, and, and the element that he's talking about is the, um, is the move east by the EU and uh, by NATO. Um, and, and, that, and that is um, you know, clear in, in your book. I mean, uh, you are criticizing the EU and NATO as being partially responsible for this, but what exactly did they do to move east? Uh, what did the EU do? What did NATO do? And uh, uh, what, what violation of Russia's rights was involved in that? Last time I looked, they never really crossed the border. Um, but what did they do that is so offensive? So let me clarify this. And there's been a lot of discussion on this. So um, particularly in, towards, uh, towards the time when Soviet Union had disbanded, um, there was this feeling, particularly in France, uh, that um, a reunified Germany would be bringing back the same problems of a century back. Uh, kind of like the militarism, kind of like the domination of Europe. But how can we kind of not have that happen again? And one of those discussions led to primarily a census between Washington, Paris, Berlin, to say that how do we bring Europe into benefiting globalization into the 21st century without leaving and leaving space for this argument that uh, where we've left some countries behind and therefore it's justified because it's an age-old tradition and we're going to basically follow what we did in the past. But how do we bring the benefits of the past and integrate to the benefits of the future? And one of those discussions meant that you integrate all of Europe as one. And that was the European Union experiment. And the European exper Union experiment for me is basically Europe's way of saying we are the European UN. Okay, if there's any disputes that can happen, you know, it will be brought to the European Union and we shall resolve. But here's the problem. Um, it has always worked in a Western European standard. You've integrated uh, Eastern European countries, but you've basically never given them that kind of a statute. If you look at the makeup and the architectural makeup of the European, okay, it is always dominated by France, Germany, and of course, Britain, although Britain now because of its Brexit nature, has a very, I would say, a Are less you saying that tone. the EU was, uh, was the original concept of the EU was to include Russia and its, uh, its uh, satellite states? No. Uh, what I am saying is that over time, there was this feeling that in the European Union, you can have a, you can have a relationship with Russia without having to integrate them in as a member. Okay, and this worked, this worked for some time, but it didn't work particularly because within the European Union, though you brought in these states to be part of member states, old issues did not get resolved. You still had issues related to what was happening in the late 90s with Kosovo and Serbia. You still had issues with what was happening between Turkey and Greece. You still had issues between Britain and Spain related to Gibraltar. These are issues that have still remained. If you go in particularly to understand what has happened in the Ukraine war now, it has basically brought these old issues back to life. Um, one of the reasons why Sweden and Finland wanted to join NATO, uh, in my view, was the fact that they were worried about, but Finland was worried about its old eastern border with Russia. They saw it as a liability. Sweden saw its Gotland Islands, which traditionally, which they fought against Russia, um, a century back, that that would be part of uh, an area that they would lose sight of. But these are areas where there's, well, particularly for Sweden, are, are military installations, even though they're small, they're very important strategically. And so you see these developments happen, but you see them happen because you have not resolved these old issues. It sounds like, um, you know, this is a very amorphous, uh, subjective, uh, a uh, way of, of of Putin to look at it because there's, there's been nobody crossing borders. There's no boots on the ground. 
Um, there, there hasn't even been hard rhetoric um, between members of the EU and Russia. I mean, he's really searching to find some kind of um, move east, if you will. Uh, well, I certainly agree that the that the the, the view of um, the interdependent defense has has kind of uh, um, it, it has leaked out from NATO to the EU. There is a a, a synonymity um, between the NATO defense pact and the EU, and they largely involve um, you know, the same group of countries and the same the same protective uh, mission. However, um, I don't think they've moved east. Tell me how they've moved east. Well, so, I mean, uh, the moved east part, I mean, just to clarify, this this had happened well between the late 90s and as well as, as early as 2004. So between, it was mostly the Baltic states. It was mostly Poland, um, Hungary, uh, all these areas that uh, were traditionally part of the Iron Curtain. And this is what I mean by moving uh, east in how the European Union integrated these areas. Um, to the point of this context of moving east, there's also a Russian context of moving west, okay? Let's not forget, Russia has a significant uh, uh, presence in Trinisteria, in in the Moldovan breakaway region. It has a Belarus, which has worked in a way to basically be like a nail uh, for the European Union to cause havoc. Um, these are activities, no, no doubt, but very much pronounced specifically by uh, President Putin to show that as you move east, I will retaliate moving west. Well, it's hard to say it's retaliation because he's actually taken territory and taken influence in Belarus. He, he essentially owns Belarus through the, uh, the puppet that's there. And Trinestria, he owns that. That's his. It used to be Moldova. You cover yeah. this in the book. Um, yeah. and, and he's been gobbling up little pieces all around Ukraine, all around Western Russia uh, for years. And, and, and of course, he's, you know, he's been doing his hacking thing uh, on a regular basis from the time the hacking began. So none of that relates to what happened, you know, 30 years ago. And he's actively, he's been actively um, uh, acting as an aggressor against Ukraine as for 20, anyway, 20 years. But I would like to talk with you about the Winter War um, in 2014. Uh, to me, the gloves were off. Uh, to me, it was Putin, and Putin was having effect on, um, you know, on various groups in Ukraine. And the, the people in Ukraine were, the whole thing was like a rehearsal. It was a rehearsal for the war we have now, wasn't it? Well, I mean, this is kind of like, um, I, I mean, a lot of the things that I covered from that time uh, kind of includes what I've already said in basically taking away the, the Ukraine's potential in its uh, would have been gas, uh, gas market. and it probably would have been uh, a powerhouse in the European gas market. But beyond that, there, there are other factors here. Um, the factors here are the fact that if that dress rehearsal would work, then there were significant reasons to say that it can work elsewhere. But the problem here is this, is that there has been significant developments in Ukraine since 2014. Uh, European Union and NATO have significantly bumped up their support in terms of pushing Ukraine to say, you need to work on your infrastructure. You need to work on your um, issues related to justice and law. You need to work on your corruption. On the NATO side, uh, Ukrainian troops, as you see today, the success on the field has largely been because of assistance from American and uh, Canadian allies who trained these troops since 2014 to make sure that they can understand uh, the modern version and the modern way of using uh, the necessary tools to communicate, to collaborate, and to basically work in, in collaboration with, their, uh, with systematic units, um, which has never been the case even before 2014 when it came to Ukraine's uh, defenses. Uh, well, now, defenses is the operative word because in fact, Putin was attacking Ukraine in 2014. 
and, and well, they were they were on the defensive and he was on the aggressive that's why i say it's a it's a rehearsal uh it's and he rehearsal. failed he failed the puppet the puppet leader of ukraine left in the middle of the night in, in a helicopter and, and that was yeah. the end of putin's influence and so forth and however they got strong you know by virtue of uh um, weapons or uh, advice from the West. The fact is, they were always on the defensive, and a lot of Ukrainians were killed, brutally, mercilessly killed by Russians in the Winter War of 2014. Um, uh, they, they were not being, they were not crossing the border. He was. Yeah, and th this is, um, th there's a lot of uh, back and forth on this. Uh, so it, when I was researching on it, uh, I came to find out that um, particularly the the separatists that had been there um, that was basically that received the blessing of the Kremlin um, worked uh, pretty brutally, but not necessarily in in uh, collaboration with the Kremlin. So, for instance, you would have Russian troop support, but a lot of these separatists had their own kind of feeling to say that, you know, it wasn't like Russia is going to invade. We are going to have these areas for ourselves. And this is where the problem begins, particularly with what you had mentioned in, this, in the sense that, you know, you have significant brutality. Um, I believe that, you know, had, had this dress rehearsal waited, um, maybe this kind of atrocity would not have happened because before 2014, much of the activity, particularly interference of Russian activity in, in Ukraine, was centered in Kiev. It was not towards the east. In 2004, Ukraine had a problem with an east and a west uh, issue where you had the eastern Ukrainian population that was very nostalgic about the Soviet era. They were not exactly in tune with the globalization. They, they spoke Russian. They liked the idea of the Russian model. Western Ukraine was completely different. They wanted to align with Europe. They wanted to see the benefits of Europe. The youth wanted the youth wanted the Kiev to look like Paris, London, or New York. They did not want it to look like Moscow. Um, so to the point that you're making is the fact that this brutality happened, yes, because of the dress rehearsal, but the dress rehearsal itself, when you look at the systematic way how it developed, was exactly neither did it benefit Moscow nor did it benefit the separatists. As a matter of fact, it brought the conflict against Europe closer. And I make the argument in this book that had Crimea not been annexed, I think the situation right now would not have happened, of course. But it probably would have been a little more dangerous because of the fact that for years, most of the times when the Soviet Union and Russia had engaged in conflict. It was usually when they were doing well, when gas prices were uh, pr pretty uh, pretty manageable and pretty manageable in the sense that their coffers were getting a lot of revenue from these gas profits. So if you look at the, the, the Russian uh, interference in Syria, the Russian interference in Chechnya, um, the, the, the Russian uh, interference in Ukraine, in 2014, um, these are all times when petroleum gases brought significant uh, significant revenue to the state. Now, right now, that is not the case because it's under severe sanctions, and it has lifeline in other states that basically is giving them uh, kind of like substandard rates. But they have no choice. They have no choice. But at the same time. One of the things that I talk about in this book is that as President Zelensky of Ukraine is really trying to harmonize his support with the European Union and Western Europe, the same Western European partners are the ones that propelled Putin to this point. Because when he came to power, one of the agreement or the default agreement was, as long as you do not do anything bad that brings us into a full straight conflict, we will buy gas, we will buy oil. But 22 years later, here we are. Mm. You know, one thing that strikes me from what you say, it's really interesting, is that, you know, there's this uh, concept that of the, uh, I guess it's the Kennedy School of uh, Foreign Policy, and um, um, it, it's soft power and smart power. 
And uh, theoretically, at least, it's, it's part of the American arsenal of um, diplomacy. Um, yeah, I mean, does, but, it doesn't sound but, like Putin did that. It sounds but like Jay, I mean, yeah. but Jay, I think, I mean, I argue about soft power context as well in this book to say that, you know, Europe always thought that, okay, we can work on our soft power as long as the United States provides us with security. But here's the problem, okay? Uh, you can't rely on, uh, on soft power to galvanize an economy that is not growing, despite security assurances from the United States. Now, we're at an age where, you know, we are looking at decreasing security, particularly on the United States side, to basically cover Europe, because Europe needs to pull its weight. But Europe hasn't pulled its weight because it believes in its soft power, which still hasn't worked. <laughs> what, about, what about on the other side, though? You talk about Europe uh, it, it, with advice and counsel to Ukraine, Europe trying to help Ukraine, you and try, trying to build infrastructure, trying to build industry. It's all, you know, commendable. Um, and, you know, it's a sort of a, a, a natural thing if the U.S. is involved. Um, but query, you know, all we see from Russia, and disagree with me, all we see from Russia is we want to take territory. We want to take Crimea. Uh, we want to take Ukraine. We want to expand our borders to what they were, you know, before we lost the uh, Soviet Union. Wouldn't it have been better for Putin and, in fact, the whole Russian you know, apparatus uh, to try soft power because they have a, 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 a natural um, a fertile ground in terms of appreciating and language and culture, appreciating the Russian, you know, their own Russian background. Um, but he didn't do that. Uh, it's well, always violence. It's always aggression. It's never let's work together. Let's try to build relationships. Um, trade agreements, um, cultural uh, interchange, all that. He doesn't do it. He isn't doing it now. There's no indication he wants to do it in the future. Isn't that a huge mistake? I think one of the reasons why you see that is because of what has happened in the last four years, particularly with what has happened with COVID. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, if you see the reports uh, of news about Russians leaving because they're going to be conscripted for this war, and many of them choose not to want to fight because they know it's a losing battle. Um, a lot of the hackers that we used to hear about, um, you know, nobody talks about them. And I suspect they're the ones who've left. Um, a lot of, uh, <laughs> lot of uh, intellectual brain drain that you talk about in terms of in terms of uh, you know soft power, diplomacy, culture, uh, links, this is all part of the intellectual elite that that I suspect has left Russia uh, since 2021. Because uh, bear in mind that you know the preparations for this war had been had been uh, in place since March 2021, and so I think in that you know now we're approaching. Uh, second year since March 2021. Um, and I think by now, a lot of this brain drain that Russia is facing is a result and a consequence of why they're kind of, I think, shunned the soft power feeling. Is, is uh, Putin going to be able to hold on to uh, leadership? I mean, he's using uh, every autocratic method he can find. But uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, Russia does have a history of, uh, um, of turning the apple cart over. Um, and uh, and getting rid of leaders who are uh, who are oppressive. Um, query: Do you think, from writing this book and all the research that you've done, you think that uh, Putin is there for the long term, or is he um, is he going to have to go? Uh, I think he will remain in power because there's no alternative. And there's no alternative state institution that can take the lead in removing him. Um, and I mentioned in this book why. Um, because Russia is, Russia is not a superpower, but it is a power. Um, it has always flexed above its weight. And despite not achieving the success, it has survived. Um, now, it has survived because it has allies. It needs allies. It can't do this without allies. 
And I think this is where the problem will be for President Putin is that first you will see uh, some kind of, uh, I wouldn't say rebellion, but kind of like networks disintegrating. And one of those networks has disintegrated, as I mentioned, but you know, we don't talk about hackers much more. We don't talk about soft power much more. So this certainly tells me that he is certainly losing his kind of like sphere of influence. Um, but he will hold on to power, and I don't think anybody can remove him. Um, a couple of, uh, two weeks ago, President Zelensky did mention that he will not negotiate with President Putin. He will ne negotiate with another Russian leader. And I think that is, that could be a problem because, uh, because President Putin will stay. He will have control of the state institutions. And the person who will come after him, uh, even if he is able to negotiate peace with Ukraine, I have a very bad feeling that uh, he will, in some ways, be worse than President Putin. And I say that because every Soviet leader since the Tsar has been pretty brutal when it comes to Ukraine. They've always had their mark on Ukraine. Oh. And, and I think for my generation, who has seen this uh, atrocity, um, Yes, I, 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 can, I can anticipate the brutality that is going to happen that, can, that may last, uh, but the next person that will replace or who, who, whoever Putin chooses that will succeed him, I think will be worse than Putin. Well, the problem is trust, you know. If you want to cut a deal, uh, you have to be sure that the person on the other side is trustworthy and not pathological. And I think Putin has shown not only uh, Zelensky, but the world, that he's a pariah, that he doesn't care about keeping his word, that he's not a good negotiating partner, and that if he makes a deal with you, he's going to break it. Um, so what's the point? Um, I think the idea behind it is that all deals have a lifeline. And this lifeline is the part when, particularly in this reality that we have to deal with, and this political reality that we have to deal with, that what does this really mean? Because before, let's face it, deals were meant in good faith and in good economic principles. And now that has changed. And that has changed not because of the fact that we are seeing, for probably the first time, a nuclear war that hasn't happened since the Cuban Missile Crisis, and which very well is a possibility. Now, I'm not going to say that will absolutely happen, but I am concerned. And I'm concerned because all the activities that I read about, the historical uh, links that I see around this crisis, um, that makes me worried. Um, and it makes me worried because that will, in some ways, infect democracies, not just in Europe, but even here in the United States. Oh, yeah. It has, uh, and that's, it, that's throughout your book, really, um, that this is, this is really a test of the liberal world order. And this is not just a matter of Russia and Ukraine. This is the matter of the entire world going forward, which makes it very valuable. So, um, you know, and your book is available on um, on uh, Amazon. You can get it. Uh, at, and other uh, retailers, yes. Yeah, and other retailers. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask you if you could uh, find a page, find a paragraph that will exemplify your writing and thinking on, on the book, the subject. Okay, um, so there's uh, on page 241 on the second paragraph, it goes like this. In Ukraine previously, European leaders were not prepared for the war or the handling of the refugee crisis that followed. There are parallels in this conflict and failed efforts to rebuild state institutions after subsequent invasions and the chaos that followed in Afghanistan and Iraq. There are also parallels in President Putin and his allies seeing weakness in Europe and the United States taking advantage and aiming Ukraine, knowing other powers won't come to Ukraine's aid. The Kremlin realized that what they could do in Chechnya, Georgia, Libya, and Syria is what they will also do in Ukraine, a smooth rollover with unequivocal domination. To denazify was only a banner along with saving the ethnic Russian-speaking populace residing in Ukraine. Ukraine's response in defending its sovereignty against an invader with a history of interfering in its former Soviet territories is setting up precedents against Kremlin and President Putin's backers. 
Ukraine has chosen its path as a sovereign state. President Putin denies Ukraine's sovereign state status. He says it is part of Russia. Not only is Ukraine not a Nazi state, but its ethnic Russian communities always had rights as Ukrainians. Putin claims defending Ukraine's Russian-speaking minority is a cause for this war. If this is the case, what about the large ethnic Russian populations that fled to France during the 1917 revolution? Will Russia be invading France too? <laughs> Maybe. Um, and who knows what will happen to Italy, eh? Uh, so, so uh, Fazil, just uh, one other thing, you know, and we talked about it before the show, is that you write a book like this, okay? You're covering a, a global issue, a global phenomenon, one that has import everywhere in the world, and one that changes every day. I don't have to, I don't have to look very far in the New York Times or the Washington Post to see a story about how the inflection points going this way or that way, events that are surprising, shocking, and suggest other possibilities. So when you write a book, you're essentially carving it in stone up to that point in, in, you know, in your examination. Um, what happens going forward to a topic like this? It's a completely moving, everyday moving target. Well, I mean, to be honest with you, Jay, I mean, I focused on a lot of the things that I found that was kind of the things that I found very sensitive to what I thought was an alarm. Um, of course, there's, you know, uh, there's uh, historical uh, uh, items I've mentioned. There are consequences that I mentioned that has parallels from history. I've spoken about the external actors, particularly the Baltic states, who are much more uh, in tune with the realities what Ukraine is facing as opposed to Western Europe. Um, so to answer your question, I mean, I, I, I primarily focused on the key pillars. Which well, was, all it means, Fazil, is that we'll have to do another show. The book, the <laughs> well, book well, well, a, a sequel, you see. <laughs> well, just to, just to clarify, I mean, like, you know, I mean, I had spoken about fascism, but I did not see this coming that uh, Italy will have its first uh, uh, woman prime minister, but uh, Giorgia Melani would also be one of the most right wing prime ministers Italy has had since yeah. Mussolini. Yeah, okay. And who knows what happened in, what happens in American politics? That's a that's a whole study by itself. We, we have to go, Fazil. Basil sure, Chowdhury, no uh, a fellow in the Global Policy Institute, uh, who has written this book, this very interesting book, Why Ukraine Matters, and it certainly does. Thank you so much, Fazil. A pleasure, Jay. Thank you for having me. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.